This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Shalom Aleichem. Baruchim Abayim. Welcome to our Nesia Kedoshah. Now, this trip was about a year and change in the making. And at first, I'll tell you, I was hesitant to make this trip. There are not too many people in this world that I would take a group of people to their gravesite, to their kever, who are not what we call Gedoyle Yisrael. And Sir Moses Montefiore was not renowned for his uh, knowledge of Torah. He was not a Torah scholar per se. In fact, interestingly, Moses Montefiore could be called the first Baal Tshuva. Because until 1827, he grew up as a traditional Jew, a God-fearing Jew. But his level of Jewish education was somewhat limited. And an event happened in his life that literally changed the course of the rest of his life. And that is he made his first trip to Eretz Yisrael. Now you have to understand, to travel to Eretz Yisrael in the beginning of the 19th century, you were putting your life in jeopardy. You were putting your life in peril. To travel, the he didn't even know you could physically travel to Eretz Yisrael. He was, he was once on the sea coast. And he heard some sailors were uh, making a, a trip to Israel. He said, you could go to Israel. He said, we could go to Israel. Sir, you can't go to Israel. You're too wealthy. There are pirates roaming the waters. If they ever get wind that Moses Montefiore is uh, traveling the waters, you're a dead man. So the way he went to Israel is he put on an Ottoman attire. He had to dress up, hide all his money. And to travel those waters in those days, he literally placed his life in peril. And he went, to, he always traveled with his wife, Judith. And he made it to Eretz Yisrael, he made it to Shalayim, and he was so moved by being in the Holy Land and being in the Holy City that it changed the course of his life forever. And actually, Svarim say that we could say about Moses Montefiore, Mi Moshe ad Moshe loikam kamoshe. We know that's usually applied to the Rambam. And you have to be careful about saying something like that. And I tell you the truth, Rav Moshe Feinstein has somewhat of a different take on this whole thing. When Rav Moshe was asked about moving the bones of Moses Montefiore to Eretz Yisrael, he said it's Aser. And one of the reasons he says it's Aser is because he says Moses Montefiore wasn't one of the great rabbis of history. And to pay special attention to him, it's a bezoyon to all the achroinim. You're going to move Moses Montefiore and not move the Chassam Soifer. Chassam Soifer was greater, Reb Kiveger was greater, all the Achroinim were greater. All the Ashkenazic and Sephardic Rabbonim on the hierarchy in our minds are greater than Moses Montefiore. And therefore Moshe said you cannot move him because it would be disparaging to all the Rabbonim throughout history. But nevertheless, in a certain vein, Moses Montefiore is personally responsible for the trajectory and the success of the Jewish people the last 200 years, just to name a few of his accomplishments. He built Yushalayim. You know, in the 1850s, if you were to peek out of the people of the walls of Jerusalem, you would see sand dunes and you'd see desert. There was no civilization outside of the old city of Yushalayim. There was nothing. You know, the mere yeshiva today would not be without the efforts of Moses Montefiore. The whole Yushalayim would not exist. He built the first neighborhood outside the walls of Yishalai, Mishkanos Hashananim. He built, he's responsible for the next neighborhood, Yimin Moshe, which is built in his memory. And these are some of his uh, accomplishments, building Yishalayim, rescuing Jews throughout the world from blood libels and other accusations, saving Gedele Yisrael, most notably the Malbum. He saved the life of the Malbum. And uh, therefore, what really was a changing point for me in whether to make this something that we're going to focus on is a safer I happened to stumble across. Recently I became very interested in the writings of Reb Chaim Falaji. And of course, as soon as I became uh, more interested in it, I had, anybody want to come in December, we're going to Turkey, to the cavern of Reb Chaim Falaji. We have uh, permission from the Turkish ambassador. We're going to have security, two days in and out. It happens to be, it's going to be the yard site of the Baal Smichas Chachamim Rav Naftali Katz. English dates? It's um, Isru Chag Xmas and the next two days. So Shabbos is Xmas and then um, we leave Monsa Shabbos, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Otherwise, there's no way you're ever ending up in Turkey. 
unless you're a real dare, daredevil. Okay, so um, I was looking at a particular sefer, a Reb Chaim Falaji. The name of the sefer is Chaim Tchila. Chaim Tchila is Reb Chaim Falaji wrote 101 ways to connect the end of the Torah to the beginning of the Torah. And actually, when he published it, he pu- published it in a small size because he wrote it for Jews, for Chaydesh Tishrei, who don't ordinarily have an opportunity to learn, and they're waiting online, they're buying their lulav, they're buying their esrog, they're putting up their sukkah, and they don't have time to learn formally, and this way they have a few minutes here, a few minutes there, so he published a small sefer, to, so that Jews would have uh, a few moments to learn here and there, and um, in the back of this sefer, Chaim Tchila, I randomly checked, I don't even know why I was looking, and he published a sefer called Derach of Lamoisha. So I opened up the Derach of Lamoisha, and it's a book of praise of Sir Moses Montefiore. So I cannot believe that Reb Chaim Falaji wrote a book just of Divrei Shavach of Moses Montefiore, and about a particular incident that happened in 1840. And I can't say I read every word of the Sefer, but I went through a good chunk of it. And uh, actually we had like a two-part, three-part series based on it. And I want to share with you some of the information that Rabbi Chaim Falaji writes about Mo- Moses Montefiore. And you'll get a little picture and a l- little understanding of the ha- Haikara and the value that someone of the caliber of Chaim Falaji. Chaim Falaji wrote 72 Svarim. Okay, he was not writing history books. The fact that he wrote a book about Moses Montefiore means he held him in the highest esteem. Moses Montefiore was born in 1784. If you're born in 1784, you're lucky if you make it to your 40th birthday. If you're 40 years old, you're ready, it's, it's time for geriatrics. And if you were 50, you were a Zakein Muflag. If you were 60, you were over the hill 30 years before. Nobody made it to their 60th birthday in the 18th century. Moses Montefiore lived over a hundred years old, which was unheard of. How is it possible even? He was never Zaycha to have children. He never merited children, but he had an extremely close relationship with his wife, Judith Cohen, who was the sister-in-law of Rothschild. So Moses Montefiore was Rothschild's a brother-in-law and his firm was the stockbroker for Rothschild's company. Actually, in uh, Montefiore's first stint in uh, stock as a stockbroker, he lost all of his clients' money. But he did make another attempt, and actually, he did not make his money in the stock market. He made his money investing in the supply of piped gas for street lighting in European cities via the Imperial Continental Gas Association. So basically, he made money pumping gas to the, uh, the city street lines. And he became so wealthy. Now, here's the biggest, uh, probably the most amazing thing about Montefiore's life. The verdict of history is that the more money people make, the more challenging it becomes for them to observe halacha and the mitzvahs of the Torah. <clears throat> it may come as a certain surprise but what is considered in Jewish thought a bigger challenge in life, wealth or poverty? Most people would say, yeah, um, poverty is a much bigger challenge. I'll, any day, I'll gladly take the great challenge of wealth any day. Bring it on. Bring it on, God. Give me the money and I'll, I'm, I'll happily take that challenge. But in the Sifre Hashkafa, it's unanimous. The challenge of wealth is a much more difficult challenge than the challenge of poverty. And uh, throughout Jewish history, Viram Levavecha, Vishachachta, Sashem, Koichi, Vaitsam Yadi, Asali, Sachail Hazat. And somehow, Moses Montefiore, the more God bestowed upon him, the more humble he became, the more God fearing he became. And he actually retired at age 40. Montefiore retired formally from business life at age 40 and he went into full-time philanthropy. Like people say, what's the definition of an Askin? Someone who could afford it. So, Moses Montefiore became a full-time philanthropist, Askin, where he traveled the Jewish world. He loved to travel. He had his carriage and him and Judith traveled throughout Europe. They traveled by sea 
uh, they traveled by carriage and to dangerous Jewish communities they traveled to Morocco to Damascus to Egypt to throughout the Jewish world by land by sea saving uh, Jews from very difficult and perilous situations uh, most notably and the one that um, Montefiore really earned the uh, respect of Reb Chaim Falaji is for the what is known as the Damascus Affair of 1840. What is the Damascus Affair of 1840? It refers to the arrest of several notable members of the Jewish community in Damascus on the accusation of murdering Father Thomas, a Christian monk. Basically a Christian monk and his um, Muslim servant Ibrahim came into the Jewish quarter and they were never seen again. And they had this very convenient way of torturing Jews until they admit to the crime. One of the rabbis who was imprisoned was, a, was one of the great rabbis, Rabbi Yaakov Antibi. Another rabbi was imprisoned in Rhodes. His name was Rabbi Yaakov Yisrael. And there's a rabbi who wrote a sefer, Minchas Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda Alkali, who describes in graphic detail the torture that the Rabbanim had to undergo until they would finally admit, yeah, they killed this uh, Christian monk. Of course, they never even, even saw him. But under the torture and under duress, they had no choice but to admit to it. And he describes the, the uh, torture in graphic detail. He wrote about 40 pages of describing in graphic detail. And I will now read to you all 40 pages of the torture they had to undergo. This will take about five hours. And you'll say that, re actually listening to it may have been more torturous than... But I'm just going to give you a little dogma of what they had to undergo. They put the rabbis in ice water. Water that had actual ice in it. And the choices were either go underwater with their heads submerged until they would drown, or come up for air and be clubbed over the head with spiked clubs. And the rabbis would be forced to go under the water until they had no choice but to surface for air and they would be clobbed over the head with rusty nails in sp with spikes and, and clubs until they would finally admit that they killed the Christian monk and they used his blood, of course, for the matzais. This is what happened in the month of Adar in the year 1840. And for six months, the Jewish world was not apprised of this terrible tragedy because Syria closed their borders. They would not let any male out of Damascus until one Jew shaved his beard, snuck out of Damascus, sent a message to Aleppo, and the whole Jewish world was apprised of this. This was actually the first time in Jewish American history that Jews in America had the courage to protest publicly and stand up for the atrocity that was being committed in Damascus in 1840. And uh, Sir Moses Montefiore was apprised of the situation. And interestingly, if you're a wealthy man and you hear that a Jew is in trouble, very often the reaction is, I don't care who it is, don't tell me the story, here's my uh, checking account, how much do you need, here's the money, don't bother me. That's unfortunately the attitude very often. And, Reb Chai, and uh, Moses Montefiore, when he heard about the plight of these Rabbanim in Damascus, he said, I'm going to Damascus. For him, it wasn't about writing the check. It was about what he could personally do to help the lives of other Jews. So the first thing he did is he traveled to Egypt. Now, the, this was in the time of the Ottoman Empire. In 1840, in the Ottoman Empire, they had the following system. It was called the Millet system. The Millet system was that this was a Muslim rule. However, other religions had a certain autonomy. So the uh, Christians had their own autonomy. The Jews had their own autonomy. And Sir Moses, uh, Sir Moses Montefiore... Now, who was the leader of, of the um, Syrian um, Muslim community? Under the Ottoman Empire, Syria was under the rule of Muhammad Ali. Okay, it's not who you're thinking. Don't be confusing with the boxer, no. Muhammad Ali was uh, the ruler of, and he was a terrible anti-Semite, and he believed this um, accusation against the Jewish people. Muhammad Ali had a son in Egypt who was a little bit more sympathetic to Jews, and Sir Moses Montefiore traveled to Egypt. He had audience with uh, Muhammad Ali's son. Muhammad Ali's son uh, recommended that 
Moses Montefiore make his way to Turkey. So after going to Egypt, Montefiore made his way all the way to Turkey and ultimately succeeded in having the Sultan send word to Muhammad Ali to free the Rabbanim who were still alive in prison. Many had died already. And Muhammad Ali agreed to free Rabbi Yaakov Antibi, but Muhammad Ali never acquitted him of the crime. So he never conceded that the Jews um, were not guilty of this crime, but, he, but through the interference of Moses Montefiore, um, Muhammad Ali freed Yaakov Antibi. And Muhammad, um, Mo, Sir Moses Montefiore traveled the waters, he stopped off and he passed by the city of Izmir. Who's the rabbi of Izmir at the time? Rabbi Chaim Falaji. However, he passed by the city of Izmir on Shabbos. And Moses Montefiore, being a God-fearing Jew, would not come off the boat on Shabbos. So, um, Rabbi Chaim Falaji did not meet Sir Moses Montefiore on his trip to the Sultan, but instead on the, on the trip back from the Sultan to uh, London, uh, Sir Moses Montefiore got out of the boat. Now, if you're traveling by boat and you make it to the city of Izmir and you're Sir Moses Montefiore, where would your first stop be? The governor, the mayor, the fair, the bonanza, the marketplace. Moses Montefiore gets off the boat and he heads to the main shul in Izmir to Davin Mincha with a minion. Yes, he could daven on the boat, but it's better to daven with a minion. And this was so inspiring to Abchaim Falaji that someone of the caliber of the prestige of the wealth of Moses Montefiore made it his business that when he got off the boat, he went straight to daven Mincha. And then he met with all the Rabbanim of the city. And then Sir Moses Montefiore gave all the Rabbanim money. And Reb Chaim Falaji was very moved by that. He says many wealthy people, they think Kavar HaTorah is to buy a nice Sefer Torah and a nice mantle for the Sefer Torah and a nice crown for the Sefer Torah. Why? And a nice Aron for the Sefer Torah. This way, we take out the Sefer Torah when we want, we dress the Torah when we want, and we put the Sefer Torah away when it's good for us, and we lock it up when we want, and we don't have to look at it until we decide we want to look at it. But to honor Chachamim, wealthy people are very circumspect about giving money to Chachamim. The last thing they want to do is empower Chachamim. And Sir Moses Montefiore understood the gematria of Torah is Tamide Chachamim. That the best way, the greatest way to honor the Torah is to give money to Tamide Chachamim. That's what Rabbi Chaim Falaji writes. Otherwise, you know, the Sefer Torah comes out of the Heichal, oh, and everyone stands up and everyone kisses it. Yeah, everyone's kissing the Torah because they know they can lock it up when they're done. <laughs> but the rabbis, the rabbis are a different story altogether. And Rav Chaim Falaji writes, Sir Moses Montefiore taught the world what Kavot Tamil Chachamim is. Now, because Rav Chaim Falaji was so moved by the honor that Sir Moses Montefiore showered the Torah, he wrote an entire work praising Sir Moses Montefiore and he begins with the following Chakira. I'll share with you some thoughts from the Sefer then I'll let you take a little break and we'll pick it up uh, in a bit. Reb Chaim Falaji says you might think that it's better to keep the accolades of Sir Moses Montefiore at bay, keep it modest, keep it private. After all, if we honor the Chachamim too much, if we honor the Tzadikim too much, by the way, I want you to know that Rabbi Vadi Yosef and the Yavi Oimer refers to Moses Montefiore as a Tzadik. That's not a title that he just throws around. But, Rabbi Chaim Falaji, you might think, better to keep his activities modest, after all, if we give him too much covet, it's going to take away from his schar in Olam Haba. As I'm sure you're all familiar with the Yushalmi in the 8th parak of Peya, that when Rabbi Eliezer would feed the Aniyim, and if the Aniyim would curse him, he would say, thank you so much. And when the Aniyim would praise him, he would say, you just took away my reward. So maybe we're better off not praising Montefiore too much. And Rabbi Chaim Falaji says, no, we are obligated to praise this great man, Momo, how you doing? Good, isn't this very interesting? I thought so. So, uh, by praising Montefiore, you might think you're taking away from his reward in Olam Haba, and Rav Chaim Falaji says we are obligated 
to praise Him as much as possible for the following three reasons. Number one, we have to understand that if Moses Montefiore saved the Jewish community of Syria, of Damascus, of Rhodes, this was not Moses Montefiore. Moses Montefiore is a shliach. This is the work of the Rebbe Nishalaylam. And if we don't praise him and we don't acknowledge what he did, we're being a kafoi taiva not only to him, but to God. Because Harvey uh, Shluchim Lamakaim, Hashem Liba Oizrai, God helps the Jewish people through agents. And Moses Montefiore was the agent of God to save these Jewish communities and save Gedalia Yisrael. And therefore, he, we are obligated to recognize what he did as a way of showing Hakar Satoiv Takalish Barcho. Number two, and most importantly, we need to publicize the activities in the life of Moses Montefiore to teach wealthy people how to conduct themselves. That wealthy people need to get down and dirty to help the Jewish people. They can't sit in their ivory towers and appoint an agent who has appoints a shliach, who appoints a middleman, who appoints a fifth person, who will write out their checks and they get a report at the end of the month and don't bother me. Somebody comes to an oisher, I need help. Ah, okay, what do you need? How much do you need? No, you have to understand this person. I don't care what the person needs. I don't care what the person... Here's the money. It's very convenient to think like that. No, the person who has the resources has to understand the need, feel the need, be personally involved, empathize, sympathize, get down and dirty, get your hands dirty to deal with the situation. Moses Montefiore, people don't like the tinny sound. Moses Montefiore, he traveled, he left his ivory castle of Ramsgate. We're now traveling to Ramsgate. It's only a 10 hour drive. And he could have stayed there and appointed a middleman. No, he got into his carriage and he personally went at sea, on the waters. He had to avoid pirates, he had to avoid villains, he had to avoid robbers, difficult such bandits. And he risked his life to personally deal with the Sultan. I mean, if the Sultan didn't like Moses Montefiore, Montefiore is dead. That's the end of him. To, to visit the courts of sultans and world monarchs and plead on behalf of the Jewish people that this is something that the Ashirim need to learn from. That it's not enough just to write out the convenient check. And number three, says Reb Chaim Falaji, that when Jews are in peril, our attitude should be, we're in peril. When we hear about our brothers and sisters in a far off country that are in danger, we have to view that it's our brother, it's our sister, it's our children. And therefore, if Moses Montefiore rescued Jewish communities in faraway countries, we have to view it as if he rescued us. And if he rescued you, would you say, well, I'm not going to tell anybody what he did for me because I don't want to take away from his share and all of my blood. That would be real, uh, that would be an act of an ingrate. And therefore, in order to demonstrate that we feel that he helped us personally, it is important to uh, recognize everything he did for us. And Reb Chaim Falaji penned a uh, multi-page sefer where he wrote many, many chapters uh, praising uh, Moses Montefiore for his activities just in the Damascus affair that we'll hear about in a little bit. Um, and we'll speak to you very soon. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.